exciting panel. And the topic is, can people in the UK live five years longer by 2030? And so I start with Lynn Cox. Lynn is a professor, as Jim mentioned, at Oriel College at Oxford. She was one of the fierce pe people to be hip to the subject of biogerontology. And she has one of the foremost experts in molecular mechanisms, mechanisms in aging. You OK with that one? <laughs> Uh, Tina is a geneticist, activist, author, who's created a collaboration between business and entrepreneurs to try and modify aging. And then the one that we can all hold responsible is Dr. Charles Alisi, yeah, who's thanks. a physician mm -hmm. who's guiding public policy through the Public Health England and through HIMSS, is that how it's pronounced? Yes, HIMSS is a global not-for-profit. Yes, and digital, uh, em emphasizing the digital aspect. Absolutely. So. I'm going to start backwards. You all know at this point in time the discrepancy between health span and lifespan. That one is how long you live healthy, and the other one is how long you live. So this is a grand idea. Why won't it happen? And I'll start with Tina. So just, so just to give a little, I guess, context to the, the question. So this was actually a goal, achieving five extra years of healthy life expectancy. Um, about a year and a half ago by Theresa May. So this was a goal that was set by government. And of course, the, at, at, the, at, at the time, in 2017, the industrial strategy, the four grand challenges were published. And it was an attempt to really synthesize all the opportunities across the industrial strategy, the grand challenges, to come up with this uh, goal. And, uh, and then what we realized, and, you know, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I indeed have many colleagues here, you know, through my work with the Healthy Aging Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund last year, I wear a lot of other hats with, with NHS and academic health science networks and, da and data and AI um, as well. And, uh, and really what uh, really a appeared and what seemed to me was there was no real like, action plan around how to achieve that. There's a, a huge amount of money going into the space, but actually really what are the drivers of how to actually achieve that goal? So that was um, why, um, uh, you know, why this, um, this, the, this idea for the all-party parliamentary group uh, for longevity came to be, and this is through um, Longevity International, so set that up with Dmitry Kaminsky, and, and then Eric Kilstrom has been very involved in helping us get the all-party parliamentary group off the ground, and really what we wanted to do was to look at how can we achieve this. And the reason why I think, uh, and it's been a, fa a, fa a fascinating journey over the past six months, and we've done an incredible amount of uh, incredible stuff, and of course Charles and, and Lynn and many people here are, are, are involved in our advisory board panels, We've got business leaders, scientists, you know, uh, policymakers, um, big business, the startup world, all involved. Around a big national consultation exercise, asking how can we do this? And I think the reason why it won't happen, and it's interesting because I know, uh, and I know, I think it was um, Aubrey, uh, you know, policymakers need to wake up. And of course, the beauty about the all party parliamentary. So we're blaming group. Charles. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to blame Charles. Yeah. Why not? Everyone else does. But I, just to answer your question, so I'm just trying to get a, get a bit of a bit of context, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer the question is, you know, we know that the pace of change with technology, and I mean, all of us are very involved in technology, is absolutely immense and exponentially growing. Everyone is struggling to keep up. Policymakers, government, big business, the corporates, institutions, they all are in their, their silos, and they're all trying to make sense of an enormous amount of change and progress. And then, of course, we've got the general public. And I think sitting in the room with all the advisory board uh, meetings that we've had, um, you know, we have an interesting tension because these scientists will say, oh my goodness, we can achieve, you know, this goal in five years. It'll be easy peasy. We've got all the science, you know, and of course we're talking a lot about that. Um, but then, of course, you speak to the, the academics and then you speak to the social scientists and then you speak, uh, you know, to a wider sort of group and business leaders and they, they just say, you know what, this is going to be absolute bloody hell. There's no way in hell, where you, you know, and the fact is, and I'll just say one, life expectancy the increase in life expectancy that we've been seeing has been stalling, and we're seeing growing health inequalities. This is actually what is happening now. So we have to remember, have a bit of a reality check. If you go to the US, you know, life expectancy over the last three years has actually been dropping. I mean, in the US, which spends double the amount in healthcare than in any other developed country, life expectancy is going down and health inequalities are growing. So inequalities in health are associated with inequalities in wealth. And so everything that is the focus of what we're doing now, and to answer the question, it's the social determinants of health. It's the reason why we are trapped in ill health. It's where you're born. It's your social, it's social position. It's your educational attainment. It's your, whether you're born in poverty. 
And of course, even and the, the science is, is, is telling us why that is the case, stress in environments. If you speak to experts of the exposome, I, in fact, I had a fascinating conversation, thanks to Lynn, I put me in touch with Paul Shields in Glasgow. It is fascinating what the science is telling us as to why we respond. It's environment, it's lifestyle, it's behavior. These are why it's gonna be really, really tough to Thank tackle you. those issues, really tough, but we must. Just a quick question. I, uh, Teresa May, it was mandate. Will Jeremy Corbyn change the numbers? So, you know, <laughs> I, so that's an interesting question. Of course, you know, as, as, and of course, I, I technically shouldn't really be speaking about the all-party parliamentary group because really we've, we've dissolved, you know, during the period of uh, dissolution, the upcoming election. But actually, right before we, we dissolved as an APG, and of course, we will restart very quickly, and of course, there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes in all sorts of other areas. You know, we sort of got together as a group, and of course, as an all-party parliamentary, we need to make sure we're making friends with all the political parties, so we are obviously doing that, having a, a huge number of conversations with Labour, Liberal, um, you know, Conservative, um, and, you know, hedging our bets to a certain extent. But the one thing that every single political party has to wake up to, and this is a big wake-up call, it's like health inequality is like bad for all of us. Yeah. We have to like deal with this and we have to, it is shocking. You know, health inequality between the poorest and richest citizens in, in the UK and, and, very, and, and, and very parallel with the US, it's 18 years. It's staggering. It's just like, well, it's a no brainer. We have to do something. Lynn, what's your perspective on why this won't happen? Well, I'm with Aubrey on several of the points. Um, first of all, a lot of people don't even realize it can happen. <clears throat> I, 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 there's huge ignorance when I go out there, and it's not people in the general population not knowing about it, it's medics not knowing about it. A trained gerontologist, they don't know that you can actually do something that's core to changing the underlying causes of aging rather than just treating individual diseases. Um, there, there's a lot of fear, again, um, Aubrey touched on that, the change in society, the fact that we might have people living forever, and I think we have to be very, very cautious about the way we talk about health span and longevity dividends, and not necessarily at this stage be promising the immortal life. I, I, I really think it's going to be an extra five healthy years, and then our aim, um, and I'm going to talk about this tonight as well, is maybe live for an awful long time and then fall off the cliff. Right. A bit like Nia's patient, so five months of unhealthy life rather than five, ten years of unhealthy life. So that fear, we've, we've got to tackle the fear in the general public and, and professionals as well. Um, there hasn't been a um, financial commitment that's dealt with this yet. Uh, there hasn't been the joined up thinking. Um, I'm very keen on, on having an umbrella organization that brings together the social sciences, the clinical sciences, drug developers, pharma, everybody in partnership to try and work this out. Um, and socioeconomic issues are major. But they're not going to fix it all. We, and Charles and I are going to argue about this, I think. But you, you, you have to hit all of the different aspects at different points of life. So you can't change people's lifestyles in their 80s. You're going to have to give them drugs and, and help them out there. So it's a different solution for different sectors of the population. We don't know enough science. We, I mean, everyone says to scientists, say it's easy peasy. It's not easy peasy. <laughs> we know senescence is a huge player in science, but in, in the science of aging, but we don't know what else. Um, and so we, we're still on the cusp of actually making a huge number of discoveries, I think, in, in the aging science. And then finally, even scientists can be a little bit narrow-minded. I do. <laughs> um, a lot of people go with what they know and what they're good at, and they tend not to think broadly enough about the topic. So if you're into drug discovery and you think, oh, well, I've made an antibiotic because it hits a particular protein, it does its job. Aging isn't like that. It's incredibly complex, and we're not thinking about complexity. We're not bringing that into the system. So we've got to change the mindsets of everybody in this space. That doesn't sound easy-peasy. No. Charles? <laughs> Well, I mean, your first question was, why haven't we done it yes. yet? And I think that question really exposes why we haven't done it, because uh, if you look to uh, our approaches to public health and our approaches to healthcare, um, uh, uh, in our approaches, perhaps, lie the seeds of why we haven't succeeded. So uh, with healthcare, for example, or the way we define healthcare in England, which is the National Health Service, of course, our national religion, or as close to a national religion as we have, um, um, we measure the wrong things. Um, uh, we measure hospital stays. We measure weights before you're seen. We measure interventions around illness, of course. Uh, we value those things more than anything else. We talk about 
prevention, we talk about risk reduction, we talk about responsible ways of working, but a hospital that really, really took up the concept of actually keeping people healthy rather than treating people who are ill would be in front of the financial regulators really quite quickly because they destroy the business model. You're basically asking a carpenter to gather all the wood around them and not make tables. And the only way they can actually survive is by making tables. So the metrics are a fundamental problem. And the metrics have never been addressed in the NHS. The metrics are still the same, in essence, as they were when it was first founded. There are enormous opportunities of changing that, and changing that not in a pivot point suddenly, you know, saying, oh, as of tomorrow, we're only going to measure and, um, uh, and reward people who keep people healthy. You can have a mixed economy, and of course, we need to change a system slowly. But nobody's ever made an attempt to do that other than through pilots, which clearly have a, an exponential rate of decay, to use a scientific analogy, but uh, also clearly do not have legs, because that's why they're a pilot. They're not core to what we're doing. So that's one dimension. Secondly, things like public health also haven't kept up with the 21st century. We really still live in an age of one size fits all, where in the 21st century, what's good for me is very different to what's good for you, and certainly very different to what's good for you. Um, uh, mainly because <laughs> of our different world, and even more because of You know, we're all very different. And I don't think we have encompassed that in the way we think. Um, also, as we have understood diseases and causes of diseases more, the, 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 the inevitability of saying, I really know what's good for you, I think I want to ban this, is, 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 is something which... I think has, has value, of course. It's part of a, 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 a solution. But we need to move from public health to a life course. So sadly, I'm agreeing with you. Oh. <laughs> um, a life course, a real life course, and really move to a precision health approach. And precision health, which is really taking public health away from populations to populations, but at individual level, I think is the right way forward. And the way to do that is digitally. And the way to do that is using all sorts of ways, including gamification and everything else around it. And the people who are most interested in this, sadly, are not England, are Finland, are Singapore, are Japan, because those are the places with the greatest pain. Healthcare only changes by catharsis. Right. We're, we're going to be at our catharsis very soon. So you, you began to answer the issue of not only these are the issues and this is why it won't happen, but these are clearly, by reflection, that is also the reasons what we need to do to change it. Yeah. So you have here policymakers, scientists, and members of the public. Tina, how are we going to uh, change it? How are we going to address <laughs> these issues and sort them? So I, I think there's a few things. I, I, personally, I think... Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, Charles spoke uh, to the prevention message. I, I mean, I think prevention absolutely has to be at the heart. And, and, I, and when I say prevention, I mean in the, in the wider sense around social determinants of health. Um, so it's about uh, addressing some pretty fundamental things. So obviously, now, uh, the NHS, we have the NHS, and we need to change the whole way the NHS thinks. We talked about metrics. There has to be more... Um, a cultural shift to what we even, how we even see the NHS, because we, it's a very precious institution, but actually we should be asking the question, wouldn't it be a good thing that it shrinks, that we don't need it so much? Mm. These are not the questions that, that people are asking. No. And, I, and this is the politicians, but also I have to say the general public. They still think the NHS and social care will look after them when things go wrong. That has to change. So I think the general public, they have to be on this journey. So I actually think to really affect the change, a, I think, you know, if people really understood the amount of health inequality that exists, I think that would be, you know, I think people would be shocked. So I think that's a really big thing. And of course, within the work that we're doing, we're, we are looking at, we want this to be an issue as big as climate change, and it should be. And actually, a lot of the solutions are very linked to some of the fundamental, uh, is actually linked to the climate change agenda. It's about engaging young people. And of course, you know, Andrew, I know, talks about, you know, the 100-year life. Well, we have to, you know, we have to engage, you know, even pre-birth, actually, your life chances are affected, even at the, you know, at the moment of conception, you know, and uh, 
So, you know, we have to educate young people. So this is a massive opportunity to educate young people. I mean, I had an argument with my 17-year-old my son a couple of days ago who talked. He said, oh, well, you know, this is his economics class in schools. And I do work in schools, and, and, I, and I, I'm horrified with actually the, 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 the it's such a um, backward look in education at the moment in terms of how we prepare young people. But he said to me, oh, yeah, when you hit 60, you're like, you're like an, you're a burden. You're an economic burden. And I'm like, well, no, actually. Uh, you, and we had a huge argument, of course. But it just kind of, uh, it just kind of showed me like, what we are wrestling with. Yeah. So, so getting the public on side, they have to be, they are going to, they are going to make the change with They'll the politicians. It. That, and it's going to have to be the way. And I think no matter what government we get in, uh, I, I, I think you know, there's going to be a lot of you know, focus on Brexit. This is bigger than Brexit. And actually, this is what we are talking about now. This has to be bigger than Brexit, as big as climate change. The solutions are all linked to climate change. Eat less red meat is a big one. Eat better, exercise, you know, get on your bike. These are all linked to the climate change agenda, and we've got to get young people to kind of see it as their future. There's a really interesting number that we learned this year. We were up at, uh, in Glasgow. If you live on the west side of Glasgow, your average lifespan is 81. If you live on the east side of Glasgow, your average lifespan is 57. I mean, that's staggering. And sorry, can I just make one point about the Glaswegians? Do you think, we all want, you know, there's all this talk about living longer. Do you think a Glaswegian who's living in a council estate, who lives from Friday to Friday paychecks, is thinking like we're sitting, thinking in this room? No. No. So let's just get real. That's yeah. the issue. Yeah. I completely get that. So, so Lynn. <coughs> Where's science taking us? Where's the therapeutic aspect to this? We've talked about with Charles and Tina, the social, the government, the policy has to change. What are we doing in science to help out? Well, we're making drugs. We're trying to understand <laughs> what's going on. Um, I, I was completely struck by Nia's work on the biomarkers. We're actually really starting to get a handle on where things are going. Um, one, one of the big issues at the moment um, is the way we make drugs, the way we discover things, and the affordability of drugs. And the population for treatment in ageing is completely different from any model we've ever known in terms of populations to treat for any other indication. I'm not going to call it a disease. Um, uh, <laughs> looking at the audience. <laughs> so we, we've got a huge opportunity to develop stuff and sell it cheaply to a massive market. And we've got to rethink the whole model of drug development. And what I'd like to see is actually incorporating um, basic science, bringing in... The, the target discovery type science that goes on in, in university laboratories, m extending that on a public purse, and I know that there are a lot of private companies and investors in biotech here that probably won't want me to say that, but there is a role for actually public investment. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> That's where aging starts. <laughs> um, so we, we, we've got, we need investment in things that the private sector won't take on. So we need investment in drug repurposing, things that are off patent, things that can be developed very, very quickly that we know work. So the statins, the metformins, the rapamycins, these are not going to be adopted by private industry, but they should be adopted by a national policy. sector. National <clears throat> policy stuff that's going to move things forward. So what we need is a much more coherent way of doing the science and getting it into the clinic. And in America, they've got uh, something called NCATS. It's a, a translational arm of the Nas National Institutes of Health. And it joins everything up from basic lab science through to drug development, through to clinical trials. And they're making progress. We need something like that here. And we have an inkling of a start of it with the science. Um, the blood transfusion service, everybody thinks about just getting a, a bag of blood when you, you've had a bleed out. They are actually doing advanced cell therapeutics. They are now the place to go for um, quality control production of stem cells and gene therapies in this country. So we do have the infrastructure already. We just need to expand that. Because I think we've got a lot of the know-how in, in terms of getting drugs out there, getting therapies out there. But we, we need the funding and a coherent model of funding to do that. Despite what Deere said <clears throat> about the fact that he took an, an old sperm, an older sperm and an older egg, and they were able to create a, a young baby, if you're getting blood, ask for young blood. Definitely. <laughs> um, Charles, I also want you to touch on the digital aspect of solution to this. <clears throat> um, thank you. The digital solution is really quite important because I mentioned precision health. And if we have to be thinking in terms of deploying um, uh, 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 um, 
um, uh, digital solutions at scale, there are some uh, real important issues we have to consider. Uh, one is the issue of consent. Um, and I think it's, it, it's actually important we address this head on, because consent is something which has, has the potential to totally nullify every attempt uh, we're, 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 we're trying to adopt, because this is around having a, 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 a solution which, which, which is very personal to the individual and relies on stratifying whole segments of data. And I think the old-fashioned way in which we managed consent, the blanket consent type approach, is dead. So I think we'd better start thinking of a more dynamic consent type approach uh, uh, to, to data. And dynamic consent is associated with people asking for permission for their data to be used in terms of secondary use far more than they used to. There are some countries which are making very significant um, uh, advances here, both in legislation nationally uh, and also in their use of data. Uh, places like Holland, again, places like... I keep on mentioning Finland, but it is so unusual uh, as a country. Um, uh, uh, it's very homogenous. Uh, I think it's partly the homogeneity of that country um, uh, and partly the fact there's something more important there. Um, uh, um, the population really trusts their government. That would be a chance. Trust, trust, <laughs> trust. And I'm Canadian, and if, by and the if way. There's something, and if there's something which unites the United Kingdom and the United States, it's the use of the word united, mm. or the lack of unity in both of those countries, um, uh, you know, as against Finland. So, so this is a really important issue. The second one is around the science, because if we get emergence of biomarkers, that enable people to assess progress as part of this precision health approach to a lifespan. Wow, I've got all the bits I need now. I have the infrastructure, I have the ability to be able to, because of all the data points I have and insights to be able to predict the, the chances of illness. I have the ability to be able to assist the individual in terms of the behavioral modification required um, to be able to assess the level of risk. I think Whoa! Tina's got a point on this. Now I'm really <laughs> getting somewhere. No, I was just going to make a couple of points about what Charles has just made. I mean, I think, I mean, clearly there are countries around the world doing fascinating stuff. And we know Finland, they just passed uh, legislation, the legislation, to allow, yeah. uh, legislation to allow secondary use of data. That's going to yeah. open up a whole bunch of innovation in that whole ecosystem. They're very well being focused. And of course, and the issue of trust. So I think. Uh, um, uh, we could take some uh, elements of that and looking to the data piece, which is obviously hugely exciting. I mean, I'm very excited about data. I mean, NHS X, which I've, and, and the work that I'm doing with Academic Health Science Networks, so, you know, it's all around sort of harnessing um, AI and data-driven technologies to deliver better health. And of course, you know, the ethical piece and the, the trust piece is obviously at the, at the heart of what we're trying to do, yeah. making sure, and of course the, the motto is very much don't leave anyone behind. So of course that has to be um, what we try and achieve with all the, the use of these digital technologies. And we have to make sure that the digital technologies only don't just go in the hands of those who like to use them. I mean, I have to admit, I got this Apple Watch for my 55th birthday, and I still don't really know how to use it, even though I really want to. But Ask an I will eventually, in fact. Um, but you know, uh, it's it's uh, uh, so. I think there's a huge opportunity around data, and I think a huge opportunity going back to some of the points earlier around the social terms of health. At the moment, there's so much focus on the 10%, the sick space, NHS. The health, you know, the new, the, the the digital innovation hubs, you know, HDR UK. It's all focused on treatment, and it's all. It, and again, it goes back to the point of the the current status quo. It's like the NHS the institutions, all these other institutions, all the academic institutions, corporate institutions. This is the status quo, and really, what we're talking about is dismantling the status quo. It's about you know re reorienting everything around the citizen. The citizen has to be part, they are the biggest stakeholder. So this is where the public engagement piece, and this is where some really interesting models, going back to Finland, going back to Estonia, for example, where the citizen, they are hugely involved. And I think My the counter. interesting piece around data is, yeah. you know, the really interesting piece, if we get this right, and we've got a short window, Google, I was just Apple, Facebook, Google. they are all over this space. They are in it, and they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And yet we kind of, you know, no one is really talking about that here. And actually, we really do need to talk about that because we've got a short space of time to get this right. If we want to be socially responsible, and so this is the work that we've been doing with the APPG, and a big part of it is, you know, socially responsible, this new social contract, 
harnessing data for the public good. These are the big ideas, and these are the ideas that we should be looking at seriously. And this is the, this is the stuff that the policymakers in government have to really, really look at. <laughs> it's interesting. I thought we'd already given consent. Every time we, once we logged on to Google, you're done. You've consented to them using every aspect of your life. Digital I, aspect in science or in well, policy? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, a bit of both, and also picking up the prevention versus mitigation stuff. I think it's a completely false dichotomy. Prevention is intervening before you have overt symptoms, but right. what you intervene with might be the same thing that you'll mitigate with once you have overt symptoms. So um, I'm very biased. I work on senescence, so I'm, I'm intrigued by senolytics. If you use senolytics in early middle age, you clear out the body of all the dodgy cells that are going to make you sick and you don't get sick. If you're an old animal, we haven't yet done it in really old people, if you're an old animal and you clear out the senescent cells, it helps you get better from a disease you already have. So the mitigation and prevention are, are just two sides of the same thing. There, there isn't a difference in my head. So the solutions are going to be the same. It's just what we call prevention, what we call mitigation are different. And I will say something about the way we do that in the health system. At the moment, prevention is generally a local authority issue, yep. and mitigation is an NHS issue. Yep. Once you are ill, you go to the NHS. If you don't want to get ill, the local authority has to pick it up, and they don't have the budget to do this. So one of the examples I used on the APPG was um, PrEP for HIV prevention. There is a real postcode lottery on preventative um, ways of dealing with HIV. Once you've got HIV, it's lifelong, it costs a fortune. You need mitigation. It's so much cheaper to prevent, and yet the budgets aren't joined up. So what we need, and I know this is taking it off digital, but what we need is, is a complete coherency of the picture. Hence in, the metrics. The financial you. metrics yes. will drive the NHS into that space. Yes. Kicking, fighting, unwilling perhaps, but it would have to be in that space. But what I don't understand is prevention is also vaccination, and yet yes. that's NHS. So there, there is a yes. completely false dichotomy yes. so between the two. We need, rather than an NHS act, yes, we, need, we need a health act. Yes, it's a health act. That's what we need. Health, yes. Health X. So let's talk about the economics, and I'd also like to bring in the therapeutics versus yeah. the lifestyle aspects yes. of, of this uh, in addressing this. There's a drug called 516. Uh, unfortunately, it's too toxic. If you take it, you never have to exercise. It works on the same cellular aspect as exercise does to optimize you. You're lean. You're not going to look like uh, The Rock or Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> but you, it, it, in theory, you don't have to work out. So we have the therapeutics. We have lifestyle as a physician, and also I know you're a promoter of that. Charles, economics, lifestyle versus therapeutics, because there's just going to be a pill and we're done. Um, well, we did try that. Pill. Actually, we did try that with uh, some success. Um, I remember um, a leader in the BMJ about, what, 15 years ago, something about a polypill. And when I first saw I it, I thought, here, yeah, I, thought, I thought, this is a joke. Surely this is a joke. Smarties, I mean, really, really, really. And of course, it wasn't a joke. Um, uh, so I think, I think the pill is part of the solution, yes. But I think it's part of the solution. Uh, and if you look at the, at the models that pharma is, is developing into, and depending on which management consultant they spoke to last, it's pharma 2.0, 3.0, 4.5. I'm, I'm losing count. Um, um, what, what, what's really uh, uh, clear is uh, they're trying to figure out how to manage a business model which in the past used to be associated with selling a, a, a chemical product to as many people as possible and 80% of them ish would sort of get benefit to selling something to far less people. A greater majority of them would get benefit. This, of course, does, um, uh, does, uh, not, does not actually carry through very well in the economic arguments around how to um, uh, make money out of a, a product. So I think um, uh, pharma and the pill comes, will start to come into the ecosystem which manages health and wellness. I think pharma will start to embrace uh, that prevention. And I, oh, I, like you, think the argument between prevention and treatment is one which is dependent on which bit of the spectrum we're looking at, because I think there is a continuum, <laughs> continuum here. I agree with you. Um, so uh, the answer in the shorter term is a mixture of both. Got it. A mixture of uh, pharma, a mixture of incentivizing people to do things. Incentivization works, and it works best on people of lower socioeconomic uh, um, income, um, and giving people the opportunity to do the healthy thing 
uh, or to offer the healthy thing to them, which is at least as convenient and, if, and preferably cheaper, will work remarkably well, in my opinion, better than, say, stopping people having a snack on a train. Gamification has a great role. Yes, so, Tina. So I think um, clearly there's always going to be a role for, you know, medications, you know, therapeutic interventions. We need, you know, the, the best stuff, the best treatments, and of course now with, you know, anti-aging um, prevention. But I think, you know, let's not forget, you know, the huge economic benefits of simple things like walking. If we all walked 15 minutes more per day, so I was at a fascinating talk last week actually with Vitality and Ran Europe, where they, they worked out the economic benefits to the world if we all walked 15 minutes a day, and it was pretty, pretty amazing. So let's, let's and, and, and the other thing too, just to, um, and I can't remember the figures, but definitely check it out, because it was pretty gigantic. Um, but, uh, and there's a whole campaign around that, which, you know, and we're hoping to involve, and obviously the work um, with the APVG. But the other thing too, of course, let's also remember that, you know, the obesity epidemic, food, nutrition, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. And of course, Sally, Sally Davies or Colin Carr, and I know you, the, the message in the media was about the snacking on, on, snacking on the trains, but um, you know, that has a massive, massive impact. And if we change our diet, change, you know, had better food, reduced our processed food, that would have a huge, huge impact, and especially with our young people. So these are also, I mean, these are so important. So, and I think this, again, goes back down to unhealthy behaviors. You know, it's the social determinants of health. You know, what traps people in these unhealthy behaviors? And, you know, if you're an, an, on a council estate, if you're a mother with children who, and you're worried about them playing out in the playground because it's dodgy, there's drug dealers out there, you know, the kids stay at home. And, and you know, they, they, they don't go out. They, they, they eat bad, you know. These are the sorts of things that, you know, are the reasons why we have these big problems. Which also speaks a bit to the economics. I mean, part of this can be very inexpensive. I, you know, there's Billy Connolly's quote about how to lose weight. You know, eat more, walk. You know, eat less, walk farther you know, <clears throat> to lose weight. It's an inexpensive solution to some of these aspects. Um, Walter Bortz at Stanford, who's a gerontologist like uh, Linda, who will be speaking later today, uh, he says that if you're fit, you mentally and physically decline at a half percent a year. Unfit 2% a year. They've equated that to adding eight years to your life. Stop smoking. You, if you smoke, you decrease your lifespan by 12 years. So these solutions don't have to be expensive. And you know, simultaneously, though, we're going to have people like Lynn who are working on the science and, and the biometrics to, to do this. What's your feeling on I, the marriage of lifestyle and, and therapy? It, it, it's got to be a combination, but I think it's a sliding scale. So. Early in life, I think the environment is hugely important. Preconception, conception, that's the time when you really have to get it right. Um, people are aware of the epigenome, the little marks on your DNA that tell your genes whether to be switched on or off. Those get set at conception for a lot of people or during pregnancy. Exposure to pollution, poor diet, stress during pregnancy affects the outcome not just for the mother, but for that child for their entire life. So environmental issues have to get in there very, very early. We've got to instill in children when they're, they're little and they're still enthusiastic about life, they run around, right? We have to keep them running around. We have to keep them having fun doing exercise, not make it a chore, not make PE at school dull and drudgery. Um, I mean, how many people loved cross country? We can have <laughs> fun doing exercise. Uh, we had a short <laughs> right. All right, come on, there's like always cross one. <laughs> <laughs> but it ought to be fun. It ought to be something that people enjoy doing. Eating ought to be a social activity, not something in front of the TV with a takeaway pizza. So all of these <laughs> things have to be instilled. The good habits get instilled young. As you get older, your physical attributes do change, and I think that that's the time. Once you're post-reproductive, maybe middle-aged, your knees are starting to creak a bit, that's when you ought to start taking the interventions. And I will make a point that a lot of the interventions we're looking at now are probably dangerous during early development. And when I say Such early, as. well, senolytics, you need senescence to make the placenta and you need senescence to time pregnancy. So if you mess with senescence, you are gonna screw up very, very early development. Uh, the baby, um, as it develops, the, um, the um, limb buds forming, need senescent cells for remodeling. So don't mess with it at that stage, which is why I would say that actually treat aging once it starts to manifest with the drugs that we're thinking about and don't do it in young people. So I, I know a lot of young people who are taking supplements and all sorts of things as potential center modifiers, and I, I would 
um, respectfully. A certain degree of caution on that, very respectfully. But I think there's a time and a place for drugs. Exercise works if you can run. My mother-in-law's in a wheelchair. She's not going to go out exercising, but drugs could help in that situation. Um, and even your mother-in-law in a wheelchair. Um, um, uh, I've been to places in Denmark at the Maersk Institute which have uh, developed um, a, a whole suite of solutions. One for children uh, and their classrooms without chairs for kids where um, there are cubes and they do part of their homework on the cubes which mean they have to turn them. You know, you, you're basically forcing uh, a, a whole process which becomes n normalised then. Uh, <clears throat> and also uh, exercise regimens specifically for older people. You know, our, our vision, uh, the, uh, the way we project exercise as uh, sort of a 25-year-old in a leotard is fine, but yeah. perhaps it doesn't have relevance <laughs> for somebody who's 75 and living on the third, 30th floor of a, of, of a, yeah. a, a, of a tower block. Uh, and, and we tell them, you know, here's a gym membership, and they look at this 25-year-old <laughs> in a green leotard, and they think, what the hell's all this yeah, about? Absolutely. We've apparently only got two minutes, <laughs> and I'll let Tina answer, and then I have... Uh, Charles wanted me to, er, wanted to give one question, which I, I, he didn't know was coming, so that's about to come, and you each get one minute to answer. Oh. So very, very quickly, so there are simple things at whatever stage in your life you can do to make a huge difference, even if you're 90. So, so um, a balance exercise, for example, that can give you yeah. an extra three months. You know, weight-bearing uh, exercises. You know, but we have, but you will get more benefit the, the sooner you start. And of course, you know, as a young person, then midlife. But let's just, um, uh, but fascinating research. I mean, you know, KCL on sarcopenia and like, you know, the, the what really happens with physical activity and muscle wasting. It is absolutely astonishing. Um, you know, the research that's coming out that really show what's going on. And, and it will be, you know, it's that kind of research the public has to see because they'll think, oh my goodness, you know, I don't want my muscles. To to become like that. You know, I need to keep a little, and it's just a little bit of exercise. We're not talking athletes, we're talking like a little bit of exercise. Um, that, that's all that's needed. Um, but just let's remember, if you know, you know, and, and probably most of you know the Blue Zone countries. Let's remember what the Blue Zone countries, what they get right, right? It's such simple things. It's like, you know, they, they venerate age. We haven't talked about ageism, but they value age and wisdom. So that's huge, right? And that, so um, they, they very social, social connection, very, so they, they, with their family. They eat well, they sleep well, they exercise. And most of all, they have a sense of purpose. Ikikai, I think, in Japan. They want to live. They have a purpose. That, that is what, what spurs all of us on. You know, and, that will be, and that's the behavioral stuff. You know, get the behavior right, the environment right. We will want to live longer. <laughs> so here's my question. I'll start with you, Charles. So we, we've talked about this uh, five years by 2030. What are you doing today to live longer? What am I doing? And you have one minute. Well, I'm walking much longer, uh, for much longer, for example. I've really taken on the walking um, uh, challenge. Um, and what I'm not doing is sleeping much better. And that's mainly because, uh, sadly, of the uh, sc travel schedule, which is doing an awful lot of damage to my head. But the walking bit, I've actually got practically right, because I'm, I'm averaging about 15 to 18,000 steps a day. Got it. Tina? Uh, so, exercise. I try and eat well. Um, and like Charles, I wish I could sleep better. That's going to be my downfall. I am just too busy. I can't sleep. <laughs> Lynn, what are you doing? Pretty much the same. I walked here. Thank goodness it wasn't raining. Oh, God. That was... <laughs> done. Yeah, I'm really into the walking. <laughs> you don't need to walk back. I think you're done. No, not, not quite that far. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm also not very good at the sleeping bit. Um, but what I am doing, and this is what Aubrey was talking about, is, is just saving us enough time so that we can make the progress later. Because I see that, that the interventions we're making now can buy us a bit of time, so that when we've got the drugs right, then we've got a lot more time. And there's a, there is one drug I would really like to put out there. Um, has anyone seen the BBC News today, the headline that the hospitals are breaking because of sick older people clogging up beds? It was the frontline story today on the BBC News. And there is a company called Restore Bio that it has a treatment. It's, it's a quite innocuous treatment. In fact, it's better than placebo in terms of side effects. And it protects older people's immune systems so they don't get respiratory tract infections. They don't get into hospital. And if they do get into hospital, they stay less long. There's over a 50% reduction in severity of respiratory tract infections. The things that make older people get pneumonia, become dependent, 
be on the care system forever afterwards or die. And there are drugs out there that are now in phase three clinical trials that I foresee coming in two, three years time onto the market that can protect older people by boosting their own body's resilience in, in terms of fighting disease. It's a so public I, company. Yeah. If you were a master investor yesterday, yeah. uh, it can be acquired. Thank you very much to my okay. panel. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.